let's get started on the third episode of Batwoman. Okay, so by now you've guessed I am fluent in sarcasm, so it's basically my first language, so you should have been used to it by now if this isn't your first video of mine you've watched. But again, a disclaimer, this video isn't about hating, it's just some views and honest opinions that I've had from watching the show. So the episode is called Down, Down, Down. Whatever could it be about? Let's find out. After the usual reminder of what happened in the last episode, we jump into the episode with Alice in bed. She's asleep and she's having a nightmare. She's seemingly dreaming of her as a child and she is cautiously walking down the stairs of what looks like a basement, childish mumberings in the background as she descends the wooden steps. Only it isn't a basement, it's like a cabin and we see a big knife and other things left out on the table. As younger Alice tours the cabin, bewilderment on her face, she wanders around more and opens a door that leads into another room, which does look like a basement or a quickly built added on room to a, the rackety old wooden cabin in the back end of goodness knows where. Stone walls surround here and crates line the floors and in a sink which is filled with some kind of liquid. Young Alice looks in and I'm imagining that it's facial skin that rises to the top and makes her scream. I say imagining because the visuals aren't great and it's kind of hard to tell if it's supposed to be human skin or, or just a mask put into the sink to clean. Who knows, anything is possible with Batwoman. They did, after all, change military history for their own narrative. Why not go crazy with this? I hear psychopathic killers often take in stray little girls and make them their protege. That is, of course, how things work. And Alice awakes. It's a much more somber start than the last episode, but gives us a glimpse into how Alice has become the person she has, which, as I've gone along watching these episodes, I've realized that they give Alice a backstory and a depth, something that is beyond the psycho bitch who wants revenge and doesn't care who gets in her way. Whereas with Kate, the lead on the show, her personality starts with her being lesbian and ends with her hair, and I've said this before, but there is nothing else at all. And and trust me, I've tried looking for it, but I, I, I came up with nothing every single time. It is like they couldn't think of anything, so being gay was her personality, and it's weird to watch. Well, for me it is, and I'm gay, so... It's kind of weird that I can't identify with the lead character who is also gay. Her character is just so flat, there's, there's nothing. The way that they actually write Kate reminds me of the way the Supergirl writers write their gay and trans characters in that that is their personality trait and there is nothing else. When they have an episode, it's, it's usually all about that, some kind of hate crime or something. It, it, they can't have a storyline that, that actually sets them apart and just makes them an individual. It's always their sexuality or their, their gender. That's their personality and, and it stops there and that's it. And then there never is anything more. It's, it's kind of weird to me, but they did. It's like they gave everything to Alice. They gave her all the work, all the development, all the writing, all the inspiration, everything. And I get it, her character is amazing. I love her. I, I, I can't deny that. But they, they gave nothing to Kate. She's empty and she's, there's just nothing. You can't even just blame it all on the actress. It's her development, her plotting, her writing, there's nothing there. Anyway, then we get sent to Wayne Enterprises, which, you know, I've been wondering how this all went down in timelines, because the pilot Batwoman was released after the first Crisis crossover, where Kate is already Batwoman and knows Bruce being Batman. They give us a shit ton of cringy scenes with Batwoman and Supergirl, and it was awful and spawned the super bat ship. Yeah, thanks for that. 
So when was this exactly? Before Crisis? But then, how could Kate have been Batwoman, so this was after Crisis? But when? I'd like that to be cleared up. Does anybody? Does anybody ever clear that up? There doesn't ever seem to be an answer for this, and it's something that has been bugging me for a while. <sighs> but Kate is sitting at what I assume is Bruce's old desk. So strange how it's Kate who has taken over things without really being invited to do so. And if Bruce has disappeared without a trace, who is paying for the electricity in this building? Why hasn't this building been sold off? He's been missing for a long time. They've turned the lights out of the bat signal. Something has happened. And who who is paying Luke to work here? And how does he know so much about Bruce Wayne? being Batman, and what happened to Alfred? Where's Alfred? I have so many questions, but instead Kate is sat at his throne, droning on again in another letter or diary to her cousin. She's complaining about being Batwoman and making her enemies scared like he did and how she didn't sign up for this role when, yeah, she kind of did. She told Luke to change the suit so it should be perfect for a woman. Her. So yeah, she did sign up for this, and she gave Gotham back their hero, even though he has boobs now. Even in this moment, when Kate realizes the weight of what she undertook to get Sophie back safely, Kate is flat and lifeless. She has one tone, and that is all she will ever have. Then she is distracted. Someone is making hand puppets on the bat signal? And who else could it be but Alice? Or well, maybe Harley Quinn would do this too, but I don't think we're allowed to mention her in this show. Maybe. So Kate jumps into action in her one-toned measure. She just realized this woman could very well be her sister, and she addresses her as though she's an annoying work colleague being called into the lunchroom because their food has been mysteriously eaten. It's not very convincing, when apparently this has been haunting her since the accident. Her sister was missing for 15 years. Part of her thought she was dead. And she just rolls her eyes like, like it's a minor inconvenience. Alice knows Kate is Batman. And she laughs that Kate has made Gotham horny for Batman. But in this scene, it just always seems like Alice is taunting a nine-year-old boy. Because this is what Kate looks like in this scene. A little boy who has no idea what he's doing. It's sad because there should be something here, but there's nothing. It is left to Alice again to fill the screen because Kate gives us nothing. And Alice taunts Kate again, saying that being a hero really isn't her strong point. As you let Dad declare me dead. And again, Kate looks bored and tired. She's lethargic in this scene. When she's alone, she can pass, barely, but when she's paired with someone else in a heated scene, it doesn't work, and it always feels like I'm being cheated out of something. I'll never know. The words, I lost my sister, Beth, you remember her? Yeah, and I'd like her back. I'm not an actress, hell, I'm not a director, but... Should they be said with some degree of hurt, of pain? Hell, maybe even anger, because you thought your twin sister was dead, even though you hoped for so long that she was alive? Somewhere? Then you find her, and she's... Well, she's Alice. But what we get is a weak-ass attempt at sarcasm and offense. In this scene, it's like Alice is playing tennis with an oak tree. But despite this... Alice promises to stick to Kate's no murdering policy because, you know, that is how you get a killer to stop killing. You make them promise they will not. When dare I be realistic and say that Alice is kind of a bit of a psychopath and a sociopath who cannot empathize with anyone else's feelings but her own? That's my opinion anyway, so, so getting her to promise not to murder is a bit like trying to get the rain to promise to fall only in one small bucket. It's not going to work, but sure, experienced Kate Kane knows better. We've seen how naive and inexperienced Kate is, I don't... 
it keeps being shown how naive she is. I guess maybe that, I don't know if that was, is ever done on purpose to show that these two worlds, that these two sisters have inhabited. Who knows. Then Alice smashes the bat signal with the cricket bat, probably the one she hit Kate with it in the last episode. The one where she magically had no injuries from. It's a magic bat. We are then taken to some dude in a suit telling us we deserve to feel safe. Yes, thank you, we do. I don't trust a man in a suit. They always want to screw you over in the end. I find out that this is true in this episode, so... It is some kind of ad that a security guy is watching as he guards Wayne research and development and is promptly shot, his blood splattering all over the screen that holds the man in the suit. Ominous warning for what is ahead, one wonders. After this short and brief blood shedding, we go to Sophie and her fiancé, who I thought was her fiancé, but apparently he's her husband now. I could have sworn in the pilot, Sophie introduced him as her fiancé. Anyway, his name I've forgotten because I think he only exists to be that dude the lesbian hero is jealous over or feel competitive with. With him, you know, the usual gay woman hates man because man is with woman she wants. It's all very caveman. Well, lesbian caveman. Well, lesbian cavewoman. Whatever. And they are sparring together, a dramatic scene, the room is pitch black except for the few lights scattered around that, that cast more of a ghostly-like light. Sophie is thinking about the moment Kate met the aforementioned husband, and she's getting more angry and the more she thinks about it. Yes, it's another flashback. Goody. When I think about this, I have to wonder what is it exactly that has made Kate burrow under her skin and remain there? Like an unwanted splinter that you can't get rid of, no matter what you do. What was it? I'm genuinely perplexed. Sophie goes to the boss's office. Jacob is re-watching the footage from Alice's escape in the last episode. He's frustrated at that the trail has seemingly gone cold. She tells him that she can be useful, considering that Alice could attack again at any time. She wants approval for her special assignment. We'll leave that scene with Jacob's unimpressed face, but no answer. At the hospital we find Mary. Of course, we do. Mary is always at this hospital. Again, here is another character with layers to her personality. She isn't just one thing, it seems. The only character they did not build was Kate. Sucks to be the lead, yet get the least amount of character construction before writing. After treating a little girl, Mary sneaks back into her family apartment where she unexpectedly runs into Sophie, who assumes she's been out doing something else. Sophie, your mind is always in the gutter. Stop. Stop doing that. Mary tells Sophie if she's looking for Kate, then she isn't there. In fact, she wouldn't be surprised if Kate wasn't dating again. I don't know why Mary has to be a bitch here and, it's, and why it's implied that Sophie should care. I've seen more apps, so yeah, I know what happens with Sophie, but to be so glued on the empty vacuum that is Kate Kane, it's just weird to me that like maybe she likes her hair. Well, that Jacob made Sophie Mary's personal bodyguard. Kate enters Bruce's office to find the same man from the advert earlier sitting in Bruce Wayne's chair behind his desk. How dare he? Doesn't he know that Kate usurped that before him? It's Tommy Elliot, and he's celebrating officially having more money than Bruce Wayne. Yay. Odd thing to celebrate, but as I've said already in my last Batwoman video, the rich are weird creatures, and they breathe money and, well, more money. Kate asks how he got in, and he's like, What, Bruce never show you his secret way in that doesn't involve upsailing up a building and climbing through the window for a dude with a secret identity? Bruce sure did have a lot of people in on his secrets. First Luke, and now Tommy. The hell, Bruce. And we haven't established how and why Luke knows all these secret, secretive things about Bruce. 
being Batman and all his hidden secrets and deep, deep regrets. Was Bruce really sitting down and having these deep, heartfelt conversations with everyone? But anyway, I digress. Tommy is a smug SOB, but even he knows Kate only has two personality traits, being a lesbian and her hair. So he's like, hey, I thought you were brushing up on some lesbian ninja retreat. Yeah, I'm tired. The bad guy is kind of lesbian phobic, so whatever, I guess. Of course he is. Yawn. I'm guessing this will be a theme, all the bad guys will be homophobic of some kind. I'm not sure why this guy is here, in Bruce's office, it's kind of random to be honest. How does he know Kate will be there, or anyone will be there for that matter? So what exactly is he doing talking to Bruce Wayne's cousin, who spends her days living off daddy's money doing all kinds of pointless rubbish that make no sense? What exactly is Kate going to bring to this exactly? It's annoying at this point. We find out that Batman saved Tommy's life, and he's here because of the news that Batman has returned. And this man is certain Bruce is Batman. Kate very unconvincingly tries to put him off the scent, but at this point she could tell me her hair was brown and I wouldn't believe it. So imagine how shocked I wasn't when Tommy Elliot didn't believe her either. Kate gets a call from Luke and she heads to Bruce Research and Development, where Luke is waiting and takes her through the building, talking about the burglary that started when the security guard was shot at the beginning of the episode. We see some cool weapons on the table, one in particular, but then we get swept along to the Gotham city streets. But then we get swept along to Gotham city streets where Crowds gather around something we soon discover is an effigy of Batman lying in what looks like a pool of blood, with the words, Come out, come out, Batman, written on the wall in red. Kate gives an overly dramatic speech in the narration form that the Gotham Bruce set out to protect is now less safe because of her. Does anybody want to tell her that this was Gotham? Always? Even when Batman was at the helm? We then cut to the university campus where mail pads and cell phones, all lying news for Batman, the pleas for his return. A news reporter ending with the immortal words, Gotham needs you. Mary sees this cute guy who gets scared away by the presence of Sophie, and Mary is kind of peeved about that because, in her words, she's kind of looking for her future husband over here. Which is a bit weird. Is this 1810 at the height of the socialite season and she's looking to find a rich husband that Mama will approve of because she's 21 and getting a bit old? Soon she'll be left on the shelf. Imagine if she gets to 25 and has no husband. Oh no! But, of course, the conversation swings round to that gorgeous debonair wastrel who makes all the ladies weak at the knees. KK. Sophie wants to know why Kate didn't take the job that her father offered her at the Crows. She's confused that she spent five years training and then didn't take it. And of course, this leads on to Sophie wanting to know more intimate details about how Kate spends her time. Jealous much, Sophie? I'm detecting the incoming theme that every woman that Kate Kane will encounter will throw themselves at her. And this is never believable to me when the lead is a man. Imagine how unbelievable it is for a lesbian woman. There are no straight women in Gotham? None? Just a couple, a handful? Maybe they're all bad curious or something? Okay, anyway. I like a little bit of realism. <laughs> or maybe I'm just jealous, who knows? Mary tells Sophie that Kate turned down the job because Sophie works there and that five years of Training is easier to walk away from than work with the girl who broke her heart, which I can believe if Kate wasn't possessed of empty eyes continuously, and the fact that she spends most of her time at the Crow's headquarters. If she isn't at Bruce's Towers, she's at Crow's, so... Okay. Then we jump back to Kate and Luke. He's explaining to her that what the bat suit is made of, and again I'm wondering how he knows all this stuff, and was able to tailor the suit to Kate's specifications, isn't it now ruined for 
if or when Bruce ever returns, and wants to don his suit, bat suit? We learn there is only one weapon that can penetrate the bat suit, and whoever is in the bat suit, so whoever possesses that gun can kill Batman. Which I guess is the same reason the DEO kept a stock of kryptonite handy in case Superman ever went rogue on everyone. Cage shows Luke the invitation Tommy left for Batman, and Luke is confused as to why Tommy would want to kill Batman because he saved his mother's life. I have to wonder at the naivety of this man now, when he is the encyclopedia on Bruce Wayne and Batman, how can he not know that life isn't that simple? Luke tells her she could be Batman. Again, if anyone sees the suit now, it's obvious that it's not a man inside. The suit has boobs now. And a, a red wig, a long red wig. Kate is naturally confused because Luke has been sending some pretty mixed signals since Kate first donned the bat suit. Kate refuses because at this point she doesn't want the suit for Gotham and to protect its people, but it is really the only emotional evidence we have that Kate is invested in Alice. Hear me out on this, because it becomes more apparent as soon as we get introduced to Kate dating that in itself for me is weird as a woman finds out her twin sister she was told was dead for 15 years, who she has struggled through guilt and self-hatred over, over and over, turns up and she's a little bit of a psychotic killer who wants to kill your dad and that doesn't consume every part of Kate's soul. I'm sorry, but who the hell has time for anyone? alone dating, with all this in your head floating around like a big, massive, invasive blimp. Anyway, we get taken back to Alice. Oh. She's sweetly humming a happy melody whilst looking into a mirror, going through some makeup, and someone should tell this woman that you really shouldn't use someone else's makeup. It's really bad and it can cause infections. Anyway, so it's clear she's broken into the Kane family apartment, and this place is fucking posh and expensive. Where did Jacob get all this money? A security guard pops up randomly, which is kind of weird, because he walks around in like it's normal, so I guess that the Canes have guards patrolling their apartments, which could get kind of weird at certain moments when you want privacy. Anyway, Alice throws a knife at his throat because, you know, that's what he gets for being nosy. And he's not an issue anymore, so she can go around happily snooping freely. We go then to Kate arriving at a party, and she gets into an elevator, and who happens to be in there but Mary and her new trusty protector, Sophie. And we have another awkward ex lover scene, which at this point I'm tired of, but will only get worse as the season continues. Remember that episode of Friends when Joey tells everyone about smell the fart acting? Yeah. Well, I think Ruby Rose took that a little bit to heart because this is how she progresses through the whole show. This scene is not different. The elevator finally stops and Kate gets off. And I won't lie, the earring is annoying me in this scene. It's just there dangling all alone with a matching pair. And I'm just needing it to go away but that's just me, I mean, I, I could be weird. <laughs> Kate's randomly looking around for something, who knows at this point, but who cares, because she goes to the bar and, hey, look, it's a, it's a chick who's into her, of course. She is, do you know how rare it is to be gay and go to a party your parents throw or a friend throws, and, oh, look, there's another gay person, and they're also into you. I've never encountered it, but, hey, I'm only one person, I'm not as hot as Kate Kane. That well-known playgirl of Gotham's, we find out she's looking for Jacob. And cue the flirting. Of course they're interrupted by Sophie's husband, who I can never remember the name of, as I've said. So he just goes by Sophie's husband to me. It seems easier. He's not really there for anything other than to display that Sophie has been living with a man and blah 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 that hurts Kate, blah blah, yeah, yeah. Okay, whatever, I guess. We discover that Sophie never told her husband Kate's name. And Kate tells him her name, a look in her eyes that says, Come on, bitch, you know. 
He kind of laughs and says, oh yeah, the girl she went to the academy with, that explains it. Basically, he doesn't really need to exist. Sophie could be single and the message would still be the same. Finally, Jacob finds Kate, but their conversation is brief. While Catherine and Mary chat, Kate finds Tommy standing alone, gazing out of the window at the big, bad city. He's looking down at Bruce Enterprises and is happy because he's finally looking down on Bruce Wayne. Okay, this dude is one step away from calling Bruce out and demanding they compare the size of their manhoods to see who is more manly. Jacob receives a call and, oh, it's Alice and she's playing the cello beautifully. We discover that Jacob taught Alice, or Beth, I should say, to play the cello. And Alice asks him if he gave up music as he gave up on her. Jacob is not a very happy bunny. He's adamant that Alice is not going to get into his head as she got into Kate's. Playing myself here, that's not very hard to do. Jacob asks where she is, and Alice tells him that would ruin the surprise. She wants them to talk until he finishes tracing their call. One thing I love about Alice is this dry sarcasm she possesses, and it, it is in almost every interaction she has, whether it's a friendly-ish or even the more darker aspects of her character. It's everywhere. Alice tells him, she never understood why he stopped looking for her, and that she thought a father would do anything to find his daughter, swim oceans, climb mountains. Alice has come to the conclusion that Jacob's success means he couldn't have cared less about a missing child. He is on top of the mountain. She says this as she's looking out of the window, out at Gotham's wealthy and great. Alice says if she were at the top of the mountain, she would stop looking too. That is when Jacob discovers she is in his own home, and he demands to know how she got there, which is a pretty stupid question when this is a woman who they arrested in the episode before only for someone to plant a bomb on the very bridge she was crossing and she escaped, albeit with the help of Kate. But why would he think she couldn't get into his own home when she has proved herself to be far more competent than himself or anyone in his organization? She plants people inside it. Alice tells him he should be ashamed. The king of the crows cannot protect his own nest. Jacob decides to be very brave and tell her that he is coming from her. But of course, he is just feeding her lines at this point. Alice tells him that if he had uttered those words 15 years ago, they wouldn't be here now. They hang up and Jacob kicks into action. He always seems a little half-hearted, maybe that's where Kate gets it from. But Alice, as cool as ever, walks out, but as she does, she finds boxes on the floor marked with Kate on them. She opens them and finds things that belong to Beth, or her, before she disappeared, that Kate has kept unwilling or unable to part with them. This Kate Kane that, we show, that they show us through the eyes of Alice is wonderful, and I love her. A sister who loved her only blood sibling so much she could never part with her things, so she kept them with her, and even into her adulthood she would not let them go. Those things that she needed, because maybe they were all she had left of her sister, and when everyone was convinced she was dead, they were a physical reminder of her. Alice is moved by her find. You see everything on her face, in her eyes. Back at the party, Jacob is on the move, telling his wife they need to leave, and then tells Sophie to get Kate and Mary too. It's kind of funny that Jacob is this powerful man with a powerful security firm, is put so off kilter by one woman who started a crime empire just to get revenge on him for what she thinks is a bad case of neglectful parenting. We then get sent back to Tommy. He's loading up a big-looking gun and looking very serious because, well, just because maybe this is what rich men look like in Gotham, which is when Kate walks in with that awful earring swaying around. How does no one mention this and how stupid it looks? Is she doing Boy George cosplay? He's acting like nothing happened, but Kay tells him that it's over and the gun isn't his. As she reaches for it, he grabs her arm, at which point 
he tells Kate. She doesn't want to get in his way, then the poor dude. When the poor dude, she really doesn't know Kate Kane, she's nosy as fuck. She does want to get in his way. This is how she found the back cave, for goodness sake. And we finally learn that Tommy does know that Bruce is Batman, and for some reason, he decided to pay a guy to tell him there was something about a, fa a fail-save. I don't know, this was weird, to be honest. How much of an idiot do you have to be to hate the guy who saved your mother from death? And Kay tells him that Bruce was his best friend. Did we establish that in the earlier scenes? Because I don't recall this. Anyway, we also learn that, surprise, surprise, Tommy is, Tommy was and still is jealous of Bruce Wayne and how he was the greatest of all time. We also learn that Tommy resents Bruce saving his mother's life because he had to wait longer for his inheritance. So, yeah. Are all the non-Alice villains in the show going to be this dull and petty? In a confusing twist, Kate asks Tommy why he waited 13 years to kill Batman. When he was in a bulletproof suit, why not kill Bruce? So Tommy replied that it was Batman he hated, not Bruce. But I'm confused because he knows Batman is Bruce, so it's the same person. Okay, we get another Bruce has got a bigger dick than you joke, which is getting a bit weird now, to be honest. The problem this show has that that it throws so much into Alice that even other villains fall short. And I'm not complaining about Alice. She's the best bit of the show. But use the same energy to write your lead and the other characters that are around her. This show is not Batwoman. It should be simply Alice, because every episode she steals it by her mere presence alone. If this show didn't have Alice, nobody would watch. And there would be nothing in this show. It's as simple as that. Tommy presses something on his cell phone, and all shit breaks out in the building. Elevators drop and suddenly with people in them, which kind of begs the question, how did he know that there would be people in them? He could have pressed that and nothing would have happened because no one was inside them. To be claimed as a victim? This guy is a terrible villain, he relies on chance. And I'm bored just writing this now. Can we get back to Alice, please? Jacob, Catherine, Mary, Sophie and her husband are all stuck in an elevator, separate ones. Again, how does he know people would be inside? He isn't monitoring these elevators. They could be empty. It's a really risky strategy, but whatever. Tommy tells Kate to have Batman, Sai, meet him on the roof or the elevators aren't just hijacked. They will drop. Again, what kind of strategy is this? Kate tells him Batman isn't there, and Tommy insists that he's hiding, and he needs to man up. I really don't know what the hell this Tommy is doing. His, his motivation is a woman who is now dead or senile, as he's hinted to, was saved by Batman, which meant he had to wait for his in inheritance when he has spent the whole episode boasting about how much more money he has than Bruce Wayne. Slash Batman. It doesn't make any sense. Where does he think Bruce is hiding? Behind a chair? Or about behind the drapes? Maybe inside an old ancient family chest. And why would he be hiding? It makes zero sense. He then drops an elevator filled with waiters and tells Kate that he will do the same but with people she actually will miss. So how does he know that Kate's family is in an elevator at all? They got into that elevator after Alice called. That was why they were exiting at that moment. And Tommy isn't working with Alice, so... This is chance, and it's ridiculous. And it's... Kate goes down and finds a scene of chaos. Men lying on the floor. Only one seems to be alive. Anyway, Kate tells the medical crew who arrived to check him while she runs off somewhere. Inside an elevator, Sophie says she can swear she heard a crash. Mary tries to threaten whoever is at the other end of the speaker by saying, a social media influencer, they really do not need her to give them a scathing review on their building. 
Now really isn't the time, Mary. Jacob is trying to do something with the elevator. In truth, I'm not sure he knows. But Catherine wants to know why he pulled them out of the party. And he tells her it was Alice. They debate that Alice may be the reason they are stuck. Which, okay, FYI, when Alice does something, she has drama and class. This whole thing is the beigeest thing ever. An awkward rich dude didn't get his money fast enough when he was his whole life profiting and benefiting from the massive wealth. Anyway, yeah, someone feed this guy to the people of Gotham. Eat the rich. Am I allowed to say that? I just did, right? We jump back into the elevator with Mary, Sophie, and her husband. And Mary had the sudden revelation that they were married, and we learn that they'd been married for three years. And we have a very strange, odd conversation that felt like it should be something that should be addressed between the couple themselves. Instead, we seem to have Mary looking awkward because he tells Sophie how he saw Kate, and he wants to know why Sophie never told him that they went to Point Rock together. He wants to know if it's a secret. It's a really awkward, unnecessary scene where Sophie is lying, saying she and Kate weren't that close, while the camera points to Mary, who knows that she's lying. It's more obvious in your face stuff, pointing to what will happen. And again, I don't know why it's needed to be done like this. It's as subtle as a brick in the face. And they continue this conversation with an audience. Catherine is freaking out about Alice being in their home and giving her husband a hard time over it, like he has any control over anything that is happening right now. Sophie and her husband manage to pry open the elevator door and pull themselves and Mary up to safety while he goes off to look for help. Or something. Kate is at the back cave. She will don the bat suit again. You know, what is weird is she hasn't tried to call her family at all to see if this is even remotely true. She just takes this Tommy guy's word and doesn't even check to see if her family, who she thinks are in danger, is okay. Kate says that all those people were hurt because of her putting on the bad suit. This begs the question, why did she keep putting it on then? Kate asks Luke to reassure her that Bruce will come back, but he cannot. We know Luke is the encyclopedia when it comes to Bruce Wayne. Kate decides that she'll do it. She will be Batman because Tommy wants him and the city does. But she's not Batman. But maybe she's better because she is here. Back at the scene, Mary comes across a victim of the elevator crash. And a woman has popped up who I am sure wasn't there just now. And she wasn't in the elevator. Anyway, Mary tells the medical team to check her again. And Sophie is like, Mary, they're professionals. You're a second year medical student. But yeah, Mary knows her shit, Sophie. So back off. Then we get a scene of Kate dressing into the bad suit, telling Bruce that she needs to let the city know that she isn't him. She's her. Tommy's on the roof, pointing the gun that can shoot the hole through the bad suit around, like, like he's playing that game at a fair where you shoot things and win a prize. He's spooked by every little noise until finally the bat arrives. He declares, you're not Batman. And Kate replies, that's the point. Kate tells Luke she's found Tommy over the intercom, and we find out that Kate hasn't changed the glove. Yeah. It's brilliant, competent work, especially when you're faced with a pretentious, irate, hooray Henry, who was throwing his toys out of his pram because he didn't get enough money soon enough, so now he's got a gun that can pierce a hole through your suit. It's pretty easy to disarm him, and one has to wonder why, when he was busy planning to steal this gun, which again, I have to ask how he knew it existed, did the guy he paid tell him that, and if so, why was Bruce going around telling everyone intimate details about Batman, and how you can kill him? Tommy should have also trained up in hand-to-hand -hand combat, because yeah, it's not really great to be essentially kicked up the ass, and then send flying and all your plans go up in smoke. Tommy manages to press the button to the elevator that Jacob and Catherine are cutting one of the cables, making the elevator unsafe. Just as it's hurtling downwards, Kate manages to hook a cable onto it and steady it. Only Tommy pops his head through the hole Kate just went through and hits another button that sends the elevator that Kate is standing on hurtling down. Only Kate uses her projectile thing 
and manages to pull herself up. But Tommy is waiting, trying to step on her hands to make her fall to her death. Unfortunately for Tommy, he is the inferior villain of the show. And Alice loves Kate, so Alice who manages to pop up behind him, hits him across the head with what looks like a cricket bat. So glad she saves that for everyone, and not just Kate, in some bizarre sisterly ritual. Alice looks down at Kate and makes a remark about the red wig. Yeah. The CW and wigs will never, ever, ever go together. We then see Kate safe, Alice still on the roof, With her and Tommy passed out, the dude spent his adult life hating Batman and striving to be better than Bruce and killing Batman when he was so easily bested by a pair of misfit sisters. Kate tells Alice she saved her life and that the cops will be all over the place soon and she should leave. Alice says she came to crash the party but the host beat her to it, but she had no idea it was a costume party. To be fair, the bat suit is a bit more normal than the oversized jacket and the one dangling earring, so yeah, the bat suit was an improvement. We have another scene between sisters. Alice shows Kate the picture of the dead guard she killed and tells Kate that 24 hours was really too long, and Kate wants to know why she saved her. These moments we again are reminded how amazing the scene could be and how we essentially have this love story about two sisters. This is indeed what the show is, leaving aside the vapid love triangles that will come. It's all about the love of two sisters who lost each other and then found each other and all the battles and darkness that entails for the characters. Kate tells Alice that if she kills again, that's it. She will stop thinking her as her sister, and Alice tells her that she's slow because that is exactly what she wants. Only, Kate tells her that that isn't true, and then Alice leaves. In three episodes, we've had some pretty intense scenes between Alice and Kate, and oh my god, can you imagine how spine-tingling they could have been if they'd cast Kate better? And with more thought than who is the most famous lesbian straight girls seem to be crushing on? I know I'm in a small percentage of people who didn't care if the actress who played Kate was gay in real life. I think a lot was sacrificed when they put zero thought into casting for the lead of the show. I would prefer to have gone for ability. What's even stranger is that they set out to make Kate an empty-headed, vapid, vain character who so easily gets the limelight stolen from her in every scene. In my first episode that I did about Batwoman... I said, everyone told me to watch Batwoman because of Alice. Because it's Alice. Watch it because of Alice. And you see tweets, it's always, I love Alice, 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 Alice this. I've never seen anybody applaud Kate or Ruby Rose. Nobody said, watch Batwoman, you'll love Kate. Back inside the building, people are being stretched away to hospital and the police are taking Tommy away in handcuffs. He really should have thought out his plan better. He reminds us that, as he's rich as fuck and white, he can throw money at its problem and be free again soon. (laughs) Set to do more Bruce hunting, like, at this point, I'm wondering how this guy even ties his own shoelaces of a morning. And then this blonde turns up, who I guess Kate was flirting with earlier. To be honest, I can't remember. She's kind of forgettable. But anyway, Kate calls Regan... That's her name. Like, they've been married for five years, and they've just discovered she's alive, and of course, Sophie is watching, so she's assuming stuff. Jealousy is never a good look for anyone, but I always wonder what Sophie sees in Kate. Why does every woman in Gotham seem to wet their panties for Kate Kane? It's like, what they did with Arrow and Oliver before Felicity? Like, why? It's just really annoying. And so I guess Regan and Kate have a date or a dating now. After a very brief talk earlier that night, and I mean very brief, but hey, what am I talking about? A two-minute talk with a possibly gay barmaid is like a lifetime in lesbian years. Another five minutes and they'd have moved in together and began looking for sperm donors. Mary gets to watch Sophie. She is again the unwilling witness to awkwardness. Catherine is in her apartment. On her vanity, she finds three cards. The Two of Hearts, the Eight of Clubs, and the Three of Diamonds. And she is alarmed. 
Before Jacob can see them, she hides them away. Catherine tells her husband that he needs to put an end to Alice, but Jacob tells her that she was playing a song that he used to tell Beth was their song. Catherine tells him that Alice could have found one of Beth's recitals online. Catherine is one is the dodgiest one on screen at the moment. She is more than a little afraid of Alice. A final minute is Kate telling Bruce she wasn't afraid of letting down the city. She was afraid of letting him down. When didn't she just spend the whole episode saying she let the city down and led to people's deaths? Then we get the revelation that suddenly everyone gets it. It's not Batman, but a woman in a suit. So she is Bat-Chick or Bat-Lady. Okay, so that's the end of the video. And, um, as always, stay safe, take care, and I'll see you in the next one.